The story began one sunny morning. Someone persistently tried to wake up the princess of the Guinevere Principality. The girl heard the voice of her servant in her sleep, but she did not want to wake up. Princess Hilaria barely opened her eyes. The assistant began to hurry her lady, because they were almost close to the destination, and it was necessary to prepare for the exit. It was impossible to be late. The young lady did not understand why she was in such a hurry, because this was not the first time for the person to whom they came. Simply no one knew that she would come so suddenly and without an invitation. The servant did not care. The princess knew that four concubines came to the palace, but one of them died under unknown circumstances that no one disclosed. Today she came as the fifth concubine to change everything. The road began to change scenery even faster. It seemed that the driver couldn't wait to arrive at the place as soon as possible. Finally, the carriage stopped, and the maid came out first, offering her hand to her princess. When the princess went outside, she looked around a little. A luxurious road, lined with trees, led to the castle. The assistant waited a little, but then she was very surprised that no one came to meet them. Hilaria herself was not surprised by this, because so many concubines had already been sent to this castle that those who lived there eventually did not care who the next one would be, so she wanted to return. Finally, someone began to approach the girls, and the maid noticed it. The young man approached them and introduced himself as the senior servant of the imperial castle, Vladislav Svein. The lady took a closer look. The princess was amazed, because she had heard about this servant and knew who he was, so she was very surprised when she saw him, the most loyal servant around the emperor. He was also called the imperial dog. As befits a lady, she immediately replied that she was glad to meet him, but without hiding a sly smile, she said that the weather was so good that even the horses galloped faster. The maid had not been working for the princess for the first year, so she recognized her sarcastic tone immediately. The girl knew that only Hilaria could point out mistakes so openly, but it was somewhat alarming. However, Swain also understood the tone of the princess, but answered in his manner, assuring that he was not late to meet them. Turning slightly, the boy invited the girls to follow him to take him to the palace. It was obvious that these two had something against each other from the start. The girl immediately noticed this, and understood that there could be problems with this. But for now, they continued their journey in silence. Passing the road, all three entered the garden. The princess had heard of the majesty of the imperial gardens, so now she was sure of it herself, but she had the impression that they were on their way to a picnic. Katie didn't understand the lady's message, so she asked about it, but noted that she had a bad feeling that something was about to happen. The princess did not share her feelings, because she was not afraid of anything. Once, long ago, in the principality, Guinevere appeared as a ball primordial source. Thanks to her, the princess was able to see the future, which she denied the emperor, this future was terrible and bloody. In this vision, she saw the dead bodies of not only her loved ones and servants, but also the entire destroyed city. She stood in the middle of the street, engulfed in flames and destruction, but she could do nothing. There she saw her end approaching, but she could not believe that all this happened only because of her refusal. The girl watched her house burn, and tears flowed from her eyes, and insanity was in her head. The princess could only watch her life end, because it was too late to do anything. When the vision ended, the girl understood that she could not allow such an end. Hilaria was so absorbed in her memories that she did not notice how they finally arrived at the palace in which she now lives. The order was really big, and the emperor placed it at the disposal of the princess. However, the girl did not consider it a gift. For her, it was rather a prison for the following years, because the only reason for which the lady agreed to marry the emperor was the salvation of her people. The princess swore to herself that as long as she was in the empire, the ruler himself would not be able to do anything to her or her principality. She and Katie followed the butler into the palace. When they went inside, they were already greeted by a whole line of maids outside the threshold. A fair-haired girl came up first, and bowing respectfully, introduced herself as the eldest of them. Her name was Chaloster. However, Hilaria did not seem to be impressed by this. She carefully began to examine the maid, looking for a trick in her. Instead, the girl just smiled and offered to take the princess to her room. When the maid turned around, there was no trace of her warm smile. It was clear that she was not very happy with the new lady in this palace, and the princess noticed it, so she did not miss tricks. 
When all three left the palace, the lady turned to the servants and said that she was in such a place for the first time, so she forgot to say her name, enchanted by the sights. Chiloster looked carefully at the lady. The princess never gave her name, but instead introduced Katie, who was her childhood friend. There was silence for a moment. The maid did not ask my lady's name, showing indifference in every way. The princess's room looked very elegant. It was clear that attention was paid to every detail in the interior, and the smell of flowers was such an aroma that even she thought it was too cloying. This luxury brought tears to his eyes. How everything was prepared for the first night with the emperor was too elaborate. She walked forward a little to look around and met Chaloster's gaze. She examined her. After a short silence, the maid noticed that the lady had fairly fair skin, which all northern women were famous for, so she understood that any dress would suit the princess, bringing a smile back to her face. The maid offered Hilaria a red dress, and she accepted, but noted that she had brought all the necessary things with her, so she would first like to try on something that the maid did not like. But she curled her lips in displeasure and said that the Vladislav castle had its own clear rules that could not be violated, so the princess could not wear whatever she wanted and chose that dress. Chiloster also said that each outfit had specially embroidered flowers, and each of them had its own meaning. So for the emperor they were purple, for the empress red, and for the servants pink. So if the princess doesn't wear an outfit with the appropriate flower, it would be a violation of the rules. The girl was upset, but did not want to argue. She was surprised by such restrictions, but thought there were reasons. Milady thought that the flowers on the clothes somehow prevented murders by poisoning. But such things could be done by any bribe tailor. The maid did not explain anything further, hinting at other rules. The girl emphasized that all this was necessary to please the emperor. These words made the princess quite angry. She faked a warm smile on her face and approached the maid menacingly. Melody gently touched several dresses and in a threatening tone hinted to Shaloster that she must have forgotten who she was talking to. The girl was stunned by this, but only incomprehension escaped her lips. Hilaria explained that she was a simple person by nature, like the rest of the people of her principality. She just wanted to do everything according to the plan, to give birth to the emperor's son, but not to stay here for a single minute longer. The maid understood that she had made a mistake, but she had no thoughts of offending the lady. She only wondered how such a young girl had so much oppressive power. Meanwhile, the princess came closer. The lady emphasized once again that she was not at all interested in the rules regarding flowers on clothes. She only had her own agenda. Chalosta retreated a little, frightened by the sudden change in the princess's mood. Hilaria continued and said that she had never been a quiet and peaceful person, so she couldn't bear to live in a place where someone else held a higher position than her. This is the only thing I wanted. The lady finally let go of the girl's hand, which she had squeezed tightly. The princess emphasized that she wanted the servant to obey her and do everything she ordered. The maid felt great fear. The girl began to roll her eyes in search of help, but the rest of the girls stood aside, not daring to say a word in the direction of the angry lady. In the end, she realized that she would not find help, so she agreed. After hearing the answer, the princess was satisfied, and her face again lit up with a smile. It seemed that nothing happened before that. Milady ordered to inform the emperor that she would not be able to spend the night with him, the girl said, that she would carry out the order, but informed that the princess would be forced to spend the night with the emperor only when she became a concubine. The lady laughed at the servant's naivety. Hilaria reported that she had not come to this palace under a contract, but as a princess of the principality, because not a single lady who had come to the palace before that. There were not as many honors as for her, the girl finally understood the whole truth, because really no one had been given so many privileges as a princess, and the fact that the senior servant Swain personally came out to meet her was also the first time. Nevertheless, Coloster hoped that she would serve the one who would become empress in the future. The girl wanted to say something, but the lady interrupted her, clarifying the situation with the first night. She said that even in spite of the refusal for tonight, in any case, she would become the emperor's concubine because it was stated in the contract, even if she turns out to be a snake who wants to usurp power. She also stressed that the servant should think carefully before making a choice. The princess turned her head to the rest of the maids so that they too understood her position. The girls just looked away in silence. 
Suddenly, everything around shone, but it seemed that the servant did not notice this. The girls were still shaking with fear and did not want to be in Chaloster's place. Instead, a butterfly mark appeared on her neck. The princess emphasized that if the girl is obedient and hardworking, then in the future she can become the right hand of the one who will manage this land, but warned what will happen if she does not listen. The maid agreed to the princess's terms and she smiled at her. The girl hastened to leave the room to fulfill the order, but as she was leaving, she thought to herself that she saw a golden gleam in the lady's eyes. When the friends were alone in the room, Katie expressed her dissatisfaction, because she thought that Hilaria was too strict with the senior maid and she could easily complain to the emperor. However, the princess did not think that she would get anything for it, so her friend worried in vain. The emperor would definitely not bother such an important person like her. Swain was sent to meet her for a reason. In fact, the palace wanted to know if there would be any benefit from the lady, because everything was fine just in words. The concubine was to become a counterbalance to the will of power of the emperor's mother, an ordinary pawn. In the game, the emperor's stepson and the empress, dowager, who intends to put her own son on the throne, were in exile. Both played a game in which the whole yard played a role. Daughters of noble families are also involved here. However, the most important figure was the emperor's wife. No one expected the princess to fall into this vortex, because her principality has always tried to keep a mentality about it, so it is worth being careful. Katie was worried about the other concubines in the castle, because they could harm the princess, so she warned her friend about it. Hilaria remained calm, but she began to get bored that everyone began to worry about her. The friend assured that there was nothing strange in this, because she was the only princess among them all. The lady wanted to stop the conversation, because she was very tired. Besides, she came to save the country. Emperor Winfred's name was Ebenezer, a rather cruel and pedantic person who, for the sake of his goals, used the Guinevere principality in the war as bait. She agreed to the marriage to protect the state. The princess firmly decided for herself not to deviate from the chosen path for the sake of protecting her principality. She wanted to achieve this with the help of Guinevere. Suddenly, she asked her friend to check the corridor. Without further ado, the girl immediately went to check the entrance. Having carefully looked around, she reported that it was empty outside. Hearing this, the princess began to emit small lights that glowed brightly. Immediately after that, Hilaria asked Katie to look out the window to check if anyone was there. Seeing the lights, the girl asked to wait a little and ran to the window, hanging the curtains. In a moment, the princess began to glow even more, and light sprouts appeared around her. The lady's eyes lit up in golden color, and soon the whole room was covered in golden butterflies. She made a light wave of her hand and sent the creatures all over the castle. Each of the groups of butterflies began to look at each inhabitant of the palace, but the people themselves did not seem to notice anything. Hilaria sat down tiredly on the bed. Creating so many spirits took a toll on the princess's stamina. She slowly got up and asked her friend to hand over the magic crystal. Katie began to worry about Milady because she saw that she was barely able to stay on her feet. However, it would not have worked out otherwise, because the castle was big. The lady took the crystal in her hand and broke it into small pieces. The traces of the servants and maids were more tightly woven than she thought, but the butterflies would be able to get more information. The crystal, which was in the hands of the princess, instantly disappeared, restoring the strength of my lady. However, this was not enough, and she still felt tired, so she asked her friends how many crystals they had taken with them. After looking into the bag with crystals, she replied that it would not be enough for a long time. The girl recommended turning to Mrs. Beatrice for help. Hilaria had already taken care of this and sent a butterfly to report. The lady was sure that everything would be resolved soon. When everything was over, the princess sat down on the bed again to rest. Katie, meanwhile, began to open the windows, letting the daylight into the room. The friend was worried if the lady did not feel the heat. The princess reassured the girl and said that she would easily handle it. She suddenly remembered the maid she had marked, so she decided to check what Chaloster was up to. The butterfly gave her a vision, and she saw how the maid came to Swain to inform about the condition of the princess. The girl decided to obey and do everything as she was ordered, which pleased Milady. Katie looked back at her friend's soft laughter and asked about the situation. Hilaria reported that the maid made the right choice and told about the lady's unwellness. 
the assistant breathed a sigh of relief. The girl was worried that if the servant did not obey the order, then her mistress could make her into food for butterflies. But she laughed at it and said that she was not going to do it in the near future. My friend was frightened by this statement of my lady, because she understood that it was in her plans after all. Hilaria did not answer this. The only thing she was interested in now was the emperor's next move. About the situation with the well-being of the princess, Swain went to personally report to the emperor. Meanwhile, Ebenzer was in his office solving various documentary issues. He listened carefully to the servant. The emperor asked the opinion of the senior servant about this, but the boy did not believe a single word of the princess, because upon arrival he himself saw that she felt well. Besides, Chaloster couldn't explain either. The lord began to silently consider the situation, and noticed that the princess showed considerable intelligence only after crossing the threshold of the castle. However, this began to worry the servant a little, because he was worried about rumors. His majesty instead only laughed at this, but Svein was not amused, for he was worried when the lord was finally going to conceive an heir, but he did not say it aloud. After some silence, the emperor finally ordered the servant to give the princess medicinal tinctures and herbs, and also assigned her the status of concubine. The elder already guessed about it, but remained silent. However, almost immediately, the emperor ordered an invitation to breakfast to be sent to my lady. This made the servant open his eyes in shock. He definitely did not expect this. He once again asked the owner about it. The emperor did not answer anything, because he had his own clear plans for this. After sending Swain to carry out the order, Ebenezer continued to deal with political matters, signing and reviewing documents one after another. His Majesty noticed the surprised expression on the senior servant's face, so he explained the reason for the invitation. The Empress Dowager's birthday was soon approaching, and he had not yet seen the face of his wife. According to the rules of the banquet, she had to sit next to the owner. Still, it continued to surprise Swain, for it came from a man who didn't even remember any of his concubines, but said nothing. When the servant left the office, the emperor stopped for a moment from filling out the documents and thought. He was impressed by the dexterity of the princess, because she was able to recruit Chaloster on the very first day. It was already evening when the princess was sitting in her room calmly sipping tea. A servant suddenly came in and gave her the news of tomorrow's breakfast, to which she was invited despite her condition. Her own maid personally came to inform about this. The girl assured that the emperor was doing this because he cared for her. However, I thought to myself that such a situation had arisen for the first time. The servant was really surprised by the fact that the emperor had a completely different relationship with his mistress than with other concubines. She began to calm the princess and said that there was a wonderful cook in the castle. Hilaria exhaled heavily and remarked sarcastically that at least the food would be tasty. Immediately after that, she announced that she had a visitor tomorrow, so she ordered Chaloster to prepare everything for this. The maid apologized and decided to ask who to expect tomorrow. The princess replied that she would be waiting for the daughter of Marquis Genesis. This shocked the maid because he was a very influential person. The girl did not understand the connections between these two families and who Milady herself was in the end. Meanwhile, the princess ignored the maid's shocked look and announced that the doctor should be arriving soon. The doctor had to come to accurately diagnose my lady that she was feeling a little sick. These words distracted the maid from her thoughts, and she quickly began to recite the words and to deal with the rest of the questions herself. Already about to leave, Coloster stopped for a moment and carefully looked at the lady. She saw that the princess had considerable charisma, which was difficult to describe, and reminded her of the Red Queen Guinevere. The next morning came, there were many rumors about the emperor, but the main one was that he took the throne at the age of fifteen, having reached the very top. He took power from the Empress Dowager. After that, many began to say that his reign was significantly different from the previous ruler and was much more profitable. There were many rumors about his appearance and abilities. However, he took all the rumors only as a lick. But the princess herself now managed to make sure of this truth herself. The princess kept moving her fork around the plate, unable to force herself to eat. The emperor asked why the girl was not eating and met her angry look. She was envious of the fact that a smile had been shining on the owner's face since the very morning, while she barely put herself in order. The princess pricked a leaf of lettuce on a fork and put it in her mouth, demonstratively showing her pride, but looked away from the owner. 
Ebenezer just smiled and looked at her intently. He noted that the princess was quite sweet and did not look like the dangerous witch that Swain had described her as. The emperor wanted to start some conversation, so he said he was glad to see her appetite. However, the girl met these warm words with caution and caution. With a cold look, she thanked for the care and said that after sleeping she felt much better. This pleased the owner. If something bad happened to her, he wouldn't be able to look his father-in-law in the eyes, after which he smiled again without missing the opportunity to look at her. He noticed that she smiled only with her mouth. Instead, her gaze was very cold. Her whole body seemed to be cold. Changing the subject, the emperor asked if she was ready to spend the night with him, if she already felt well. The princess refused, much to the emperor's surprise, but he did not pretend, instead only asking the reason. Hilaria explained, That does not want to be on a level with others, but wants to become special. The Lord asked her to explain what she wanted, but did not let her say a word, stressing that he could make her empress right now. However, the princess did not like it. She took it as a threat. The dowager empress had always and until now controlled the aristocracy and power near her. So Milady understood that in such a situation, the emperor wanted to turn a woman against her principality. The princess could not allow this, so she made an innocent look, as if she did not quite understand the joke, and declared that such a small person as her could not bear such a burden. She began to humiliate herself a little. However, the emperor said that he did not care about it. The main thing was that she became his flower for him. The girl was stunned, because she understood that these words were already a warning, not deserving of more. The princess did not want such a fate for herself, did not want to become his thing, so she announced that she did not want to become an empress either today or on another day. Instead, she asked for a favor. The owner was interested. But Hilaria was in no hurry to tell what exactly she wanted, but promised in return to fulfill what the emperor wanted more than anything. The atmosphere in the hall became a little creepy. With a cheerful smile, she promised to get him that old raccoon who lived in this palace. This greatly shocked the emperor, because he did not expect that my lady knew about it, but he did not say a word. The next minute, his majesty laughed loudly, which quite surprised the princess, after which he informed her that she really liked to play with fire. She began to assure that she was ready for it, Ebenezer thought. His kind word carried a lot of weight, so if Milady could bear this burden, he was ready to trust her and wait impatiently. She began to rejoice in her thoughts, thanking the emperor. However, this is not all that she wanted to achieve from the owner. Making the most innocent look, she asked if she really needed to be present when meeting the empress. The emperor, hearing this question, smiled gently, because he realized that the girl was looking for his protection from the empress. Even Charlotte did not have as much audacity as the princess. However, in the end, he allowed me not to go. The girl beamed at this and happily promised to carry out the order. Still smiling sweetly, she decided to check something on the emperor. Crossing her arms, she concentrated for a moment. Hilaria decided to release the spirits to follow the lord, but first she created only one butterfly to check the rumors. As she knew, the butterfly crashed just before reaching the emperor. There was something about his majesty that could easily block her spirits, but at least he didn't guess anything. Meanwhile, the owner looked at the girl and realized again that she was quite cute. After breakfast together, she returned to her rooms and tiredly leaned back on the couch. After her arrival in this castle, several things were taken from her, but the most important thing remained with her. The princess just waved her hand, and the butterflies immediately brought her an unusual book. At the same time, Katie was very worried, because if someone saw this, there could be problems. But the lady was calm. She reported that there was no one else around her rooms because the butterflies were watching it. Hearing about this, my friend began to worry even more because it cost a lot of energy. The girl urged Milady to be more economical with mana because there were very few crystals. However, Hilaria assured that this issue will be resolved soon. But the money was needed now. The assistant looked at the princess with a questioning look because she did not understand why she had the money. The lady explained that in order to catch the raccoon promised to the emperor, she began to read the book carefully. With the information that the princess had gathered before coming to this palace, including everything she could learn with the magic bullet, the best trump card for making money was the arms trade. In the past, there were several clans that were engaged in this illegal arms trade. 
she wanted to secretly gain access to the business, then she could legitimize the trade and arrange the deliveries. Milady knew the Empire was preparing for war, so it might work. Katie imperceptibly approached her and looked into the book. The girl was surprised that the princess really wanted to do this. Hilaria was sure that this was the perfect activity for her situation. The friend agreed, but still assured that it could be very dangerous. However, the legalization of trade could improve its status. The princess was sure that such earnings would allow her to pay taxes to the treasury, which, as a rule, were appropriated by various officials. The assistant exhaled, because she knew that such thoughts were dangerous. Milady closed the book, finishing this question, because she had already decided everything for herself, so she first planned to arrange a tea party. The friend immediately asked who the princess wanted to invite. In response, Hilaria only smiled mysteriously and told her friend to wait a little, because those to whom she could entrust her plan should soon arrive. She looked into the butterfly memories. The lady saw a conversation between one maid and her mistress. The fair-haired girl was very dissatisfied with the news she heard from the servant and ordered her to bring the one who dared to have breakfast with the emperor to her. Chaloster was just passing through the corridors when she heard angry conversations between the servants. The girl listened and decided to find out what was happening. One of the colleagues informed about the arrival of Ajera from another castle. Hilaria's maids was very displeased with such impudence on the part of Her Majesty Charlotte, and said that if she wanted to meet the princess, she should have warned about it in advance. The second, assured that her lady was right and did not consider it impudence. She was sure that the princess should have come to challenge Her Majesty. Chaloster contemplated this confrontation. In the end, the girl decided to stop this nonsense because she already had clear instructions from her lady. Coming closer, she called Ajura and she turned to hear the voice. The princess was already waiting for her. Having opened the door to the room, the maid went inside, where she met Hilaria. She casually drank tea and invited the girl to come in sooner. The maid bowed, explaining her rudeness. The girl said that she was only following the order of her lady because she wanted to meet the new concubine. Without wasting time, she immediately announced that she would take the princess to the Canary Palace. Milady interrupted the maid's conversation and ordered to come to her. This surprised the girl, and she looked around, feeling that the atmosphere in the room changed dramatically and began to be very depressing. The maid was very frightened, and the princess's commanding tone frightened her even more. She did not understand what was happening. Having met the princess's icy gaze, she could not even move from her place. From her part, the empress looked out the window. The woman was very unhappy, because after the recent events, even the concubines stopped giving her any importance. Her servants were also worried. Count Erasmus, who was the biological father of one of the concubines, strongly advised the empress to put the young girl who had recently arrived at the palace in her place as quickly as possible. The woman looked back at him. She seemed to be listening, but she didn't reply. Meanwhile, the man continued and said that none of the concubines had the right to place themselves above the empress. She slowly approached and sat down in her place opposite the count. He continued and told her that all she had to do was want, and together with the concubine, the whole principality of Guinevere would be at her feet. Milady took a cup of tea and thought. There was a lot of truth in the count's words, because by order of the emperor himself, the woman occupied the highest position in the palace. The woman wanted to meet Olivia. The count was a little surprised by this, so he asked the reason. The empress explained that this girl was quite patient and intelligent, so with her help it would be easier for the woman to approach the princess. Erasmus was pleased with what he heard, and was proud that his daughter was trusted by the empress dowager herself. In addition, this will only help strengthen her trust, which will definitely help save the clan. Ajura once again found herself in the Palace of the Steel Rose, this time by order of Hilaria. When the maid came inside, Milady was already waiting for her, but did not even look at the girl, looking away. Wasting no time, the princess asked only one question, but it greatly shocked the servants, because no one could know it. The lady asked who exactly treated the concubine Venetia to the cake with which she poisoned herself. The girl began to fold her hands, unable to answer. She did not understand how she knew this information. Lady Venice died a couple of months ago, and the details of her death were not known to anyone. No one even suspected that the reason for this was an ordinary cake that she ate before her death. No one knew, except the culprits, of course, so the question arose as to how Milady knew. 
Ajura was on the verge of panic. Words could not fly out of her mouth. She was frantically changing her dress, and the princess noticed it, so she said with a smile that she hadn't told anyone about it yet. However, now Hilaria understood that she had caught the girl, so, hiding a warm smile, she ordered the maid to kneel, and she immediately obeyed, exclaiming apology. She bowed her head even lower. Milady thought and realized that judging by the reaction of the servants, Charlotte was the most influential among the concubines right now. She was not mistaken when she thought that she could be entrusted with the organization of the tea party. In a moment she turned to the maid and asked the real reason why she came to her. The girl anxiously began to say that all the concubines wanted to meet the princess, which she informed. However, Milady was not interested in this at all. She did not care and told the maid about it. The lady deliberately informed that she was a princess of the Guinevere Principality and asked if Charlotte had a higher title. The girl began to answer that it was not so. Panic gripped the poor woman more and more. The princess was getting more and more annoyed, but did not show it, only clarified why the lady allowed herself these orders. Without another word, she sent the senior maid of the Canary Palace back to her mistress, and without explaining anything, said that she should already know what to report to her mistress about everything and sent her away. The maid immediately left the room without delay. The rest of the girls just stared at her without saying a word. Each of them began to sympathize somewhat with a jury, but were glad that they were on Hilaria's side. When the door closed behind the maid, Katie breathed a sigh of relief. The princess immediately drew attention to this, thinking that the girls wanted to say something, but they immediately refused. I didn't want to talk about it. The maid, meanwhile, was walking slowly through the corridors back to her palace. Her legs could barely carry her. She felt that her heart was about to run into her heels. It seemed that the princess was looking through her. She had the feeling that she was still being followed, so she turned around, but without noticing anyone, she moved on. Rumors about Lady Charlotte have just started. The maid hoped she hadn't made a mistake. As soon as Ajura approached the princess, it felt as if she was under a spell and there was no way to disobey. She heard that the lady was only in her twenties, so she didn't know where she got such strength from. She continued walking, knowing that if she came empty-handed, her mistress would quarrel, but it was better than being next to the princess once more. There was a feeling that soon everything would change. A carriage was speeding along the already familiar forest road. A girl with bright blonde hair was sitting inside. She kept looking out the window, waiting for a quick arrival. Nearby, they tried to silence her. Laughter was heard in the emperor's office. Swain turned to the lord's voice and asked what had amused him so much. Ebenezer informed the servant of the latest news he had heard from the rest. The boy also knew that the princess literally put Ajura on her knees. This made the emperor laugh even harder. He hoped that this lady would bring even more surprises in the future. However, the elder was not amused. On the contrary, he was even worried because he believed that the princess could cause turmoil around her, which would disturb the empress. The concubines kept a certain order before that. Someone entered the room inaudibly. Carefully placing his hand on the shoulder of the senior servant, he replied that there was nothing to worry about, but he liked it even more. Duke Venique Clarinet smiled. The young lord believed that the princess could be a breath of fresh air in this rotting swamp that the palace had now become. The emperor looked up at the guest and greeted him with a nod. Herzog did the same. His majesty confirmed Venique's words with a satisfied smile, saying that the princess was indeed different from the rest of the concubines. He suddenly remembered her favor request. Her look and grace began to captivate the emperor as if he saw a rosebud in front of him. Meanwhile, Swain noticed that Lady Charlotte would not look at it so easily and could do something. The emperor assured that Hilaria was not one of the simple ones either, but this did not convince the senior servant. The guy started to panic, because a big conflict could happen. He did not want another scandal. The elder began to wriggle out of the count's hands in the hope that the emperor would listen to his requests. The lord, meanwhile, only smiled. He was very interested in what the princess would do next. A carriage arrived at the palace, from which Beatrice slowly got out Genesis, the only daughter in the Genesis family. They immediately came to meet the girl. Chaloster respectfully bowed her head as she greeted the princess's guest. The lady already knew this maid, but she was a little surprised to see her in Hilaria's yard. The maid confirmed that she now serves in Milady, and the friend asked her to take good care of Milady. With a joyful smile, 
She explained that the princess had never been to the imperial palace before, so she did not understand people well. Milady could be difficult at first, so help is needed. However, the maid herself could not imagine that the princess had problems at the beginning, because she herself saw how she could easily subdue any servant, but she did not give it away. Beatrice called her maid. The servant came, and the girl asked her to bring the package they had taken with them. The maid obeyed and quickly returned with a box, inside which was an ornament, a gift for milady. Chaloster looked around at the exquisite diamonds shining inside the earrings and necklace. The maid could not take her eyes away, because she had never seen such luxury before. The stones seemed to shine brighter than the sun. In a moment, the servant forced herself to look away, and offered to show the guest to the princess. When the door to the room opened, then Beatrice, meeting Hilaria's gaze, threw herself into her arms. Hugging her friend tighter, the guest felt as if she had lost a little weight, which she was not happy about, so she asked if she was eating well. Hilaria only smiled at this and replied that, on the contrary, she got better. The princess sent Coloster to bring tea and treats to the room. The maid obeyed and immediately went to carry out the order. When the maid disappeared, Bia immediately asked about the magic ball. The girl asked whether the princess checked all this for the truth. Milady calmed her down and offered to sit down first, clarifying that she didn't need to check it herself as she had found another way. The princess reported that the number of horses sold to them by Erkin had halved, and their quality was much better. This coincided in time with the attack of the Zakari tribe, which did not have normal weapons. She frowned a little, and her tone became more serious. Milady was sure that with the help of this tribe, Erkin tried to strike at Guinevere. Soon, probably, he will enter into negotiations with Oswald. Bia began to worry. She understood what this could lead to, because Oswald always had his sights set on the Empire. Hilaria confirmed her fears with the start of the war that the two were definitely preparing for. The princess confidently declared that the only thing she can achieve now is the unification of her principality with the Empire to prevent this war. Her friend was completely on her side and asked how she could be useful. Milady immediately asked the girl to check the clan that was engaged in arms smuggling. The friend was surprised and a little scared because it could be dangerous, but she was assured that there was a plan for this. The princess said that, first of all, she wanted to have a tea party. As a new concubine, she had many reasons for this, but first she needed to gather all the necessary information. She also asked a friend to check on Duke Clarinet and Count Nartan. As Hilaria knew, these were one of the most influential clans. It would be even better if they could collect compromising material on them. While the ladies were talking and making plans, Katie was putting things in order. She came across a gift that Bia had brought and said that they would be able to last two months on this. The girl immediately smiled. She was glad she could help by bringing everything she had, though she was a little worried that Chaloster might start checking the boxes. But that didn't happen. The princess took a single crystal and began to examine it. In a moment, I was pleasantly surprised, because these were high-level crystals. The friend said that she worked a lot to get them and promised to bring more. She admitted that she had bought an entire empty island where these crystals were located. She did not know that the extracted crystals would last for a long time, but she promised that she would send another batch in the near future. Katie, hearing the lady's conversation, was glad to hear that everything was slowly getting back to normal, and plans were being made, so she decided not to disturb the girls and went on sorting things out. Hilaria sincerely thanked Bia. Meanwhile, Ajura returned to her mistress in the palace. Lady Charlotte expected that this time she would not come alone, but noticing the maid who was barely weaving, she became very angry and almost killed her on the spot. In the end, tea and treats were brought to the rooms, and the friend immediately began to treat herself. The girl immediately fell in love with the cakes and the cake, praising their taste. The princess was happy to see her friend's happiness. Taking a cup of tea in her hands, the lady asked the princess how her first meeting with the emperor was and what she thought of him. But I thought about how to answer better, because I didn't want to make jokes about it. The princess did not want to admit to her friend that she found the emperor quite handsome and replied that he looked dangerous. Bia was surprised and asked if it was because she didn't want to spend the night with him. Milady replied that she simply does not like it when someone lies in her bed. All this was heard by Chaloster, who was standing nearby. For herself, the maid noticed that the emperor was not just anyone, but kept silent. 
Beatrice almost choked on her tea when she started laughing so hard. She liked her friend's answer very much and said that if the other concubines had heard it, they would have fainted, and she also had one piece of news. A friend reported that a ball for the Empress's birthday was soon to take place. However, the princess already knew about it. The girl asked if Hilaria had prepared any gift, and the lady thought about it. Charlotte still could not calm down. In fact, she became even more angry. She did not stop blaming her servant for everything. Azura did not answer anything to this, only bowing her head and apologizing. The rest of the maids immediately began to clean up their mistress's broken serving utensils. The lady's anger spilled over to the rest of the girls, and they worried that they would not get it. The concubine called the princess a lot. She stopped screaming and breaking everything for a moment. The lady did not understand why the new concubine did not show her any respect, as the others did. Thoughts were interrupted by Ajura, who warned. The maid informed that the princess was not like the others, so she should be careful at her expense. But this only annoyed Charlotte. She did not believe a single word of the servant, scolding for it. The lady blamed the girl for daring to say something else to her without completing the task. But the maid only wanted to warn, but they did not want to listen to her. The maid understood what this would lead to. Charlotte calmed down and turned to the window, looking into the distance. Without even looking at the maid, she ordered her to once again go to the Palace of the Steel Rose and inform her of her arrival. The day of the meeting came and people around were preparing for it. The princess was also supposed to come, so she actively prepared and was helped by Coloster, who really knew how to dress up beautifully. The lady sincerely praised her. Milady thought to herself again that her maid was really talented in this. Because among the higher people it was necessary to follow fashion, it was the basis of social life. And she liked this style. She stood up from her chair firmly declaring that she was now definitely ready for war, implying that this would be the first confrontation between the concubines when she finally showed herself to everyone. Katie supported her. Following the princess's friend, Coloster took the floor. The girl was sure that her mistress would definitely not leave anyone indifferent and affirmatively said that she would definitely win. Hilaria thanked for these words. The princess arrived at the appointed place, where Lady Charlotte was already waiting for her. Both ladies sat down at the table, but the atmosphere immediately became quite cold, but the concubines gave friendly smiles. The silence continued. Everyone kept their level. Hilaria admitted that this lady was not one of the simple ones, and not one of those who would attack without any reason and mindlessly. Finally, Charlotte broke the silence. She apologized for yesterday's incident, but her eyes were angry. This apology was difficult for her, but it was necessary for further steps. The princess said it needed no apology. Milady smiled warmly, making an innocent look, and said that she would like to make friends, hoping for future cooperation. This is what a new acquaintance wanted and promised to help in everything. The princess gritted her teeth at this offer because she knew what she really wanted, and it was definitely not help. Not far from the table stood the princess's maids. Katie looked at the situation and was worried. Hilaria also made her move. She lightly touched the interlocutor's hand and said that she hoped for help in changing the order in this palace. Charlotte was uncomfortable with her touch. The lady finally showed her character and replied that one who was born in a remote village should not think about it and the status of a princess did not confer any privileges, so let a knowledgeable person handle it. The princess realized that she should change her tone and there was no time for kindness. She got up a little and said that she doesn't have time to play with a child who only does things that are constantly capricious. In addition, a jura, apparently, had not yet informed her mistress that Hilaria already knew about the secret of Venice's death, so she warned that if others found out about it, then everything would not end in prison for her. Milady no longer concealed her intentions and reported that the more insolent the interlocutor is, the less patience she has. Now it's up to Charlotte to choose how her fate will unfold, but the lady doesn't mind making friends. She reassured the concubine because at the moment she was not going to do anything bad to her. The girl quickly removed her hand and looked angrily at the princess, who offered her palm again in the hope of cooperation. The news greatly shocked the concubine. She did not know that the princess knew the details of the death of one of them. The lady understood that she had jumped to conclusions, so she first decided to play along with my lady. Charlotte agreed to the terms, and Hilaria clapped her hands happily. The lady immediately decided to ask for one request, and said that she wanted to invite guests to a tea party, 
but she did not know how to organize, after which she asked to help her in this. The rival was a little squinted with anger, but she didn't want to show it, so she agreed. The princess smiled and thanked her without looking away. However, before all this, Milady wanted to get acquainted with two more concubines, hearing the computer brightened slightly and said that if the princess had a time, she could arrange everything tomorrow. The princess agreed to this and promised to find time. Charlotte smiled, but decided for herself to send letters to the concubines, in which they would force her to refuse to meet with Hilaria. The girl wanted to put a new concubine in her place, but Milady seemed to have guessed everything. When she looked up, she met the cruel gaze of the princess, who told her not to make mistakes. When the flower in the lady's hands broke, Charlotte realized that this time the plan would not succeed. She changed her position and assured the interlocutor that they would definitely like it. The girl looked away from the interlocutor as much as possible, and the princess finally understood that if she obeyed her, the others would also soon take her side. The emperor remained the last. His ice-cold smile did not make it clear exactly what was on his mind. In addition, the butterflies could not reach his rooms because something was blocking them. She was interested in what kind of person he was. Evening came, and the news of today's events finally reached the ears of Swain, who hastened to share them with the emperor. The elder said that the princess managed to sway even Charlotte. However, the servant was sure that everything would not end there, and the concubine would not let it go so easily. It seemed to the Lord that the elder was taking the side of the girl, but he refused. He only said that the lady had taken a certain position from the castle and had previously opposed the empress. Duke Clarinet smiled and immediately bet on the princess, which surprised the emperor. Ebenezer asked why he did not support his half-sister, to which the duke replied that it was the first time he had seen someone blow up this palace, and the sister was not distinguished by a brilliant mind and was not capable of great deeds. The Lord smiled at the Duke's coldness, even towards his loved ones. In a moment, his eyes returned to the documents again. The Emperor already knew that Milady had recently been invited by Ms. Genesis. He knew that this lady, together with the Princess, studied at the Lycée Lyon in the Principality of Guinevere. However, the question arose why such a famous family sent their only daughter to study so far from home. However, both girls were troubled by doubts about His Majesty. In the end, he bet on the princess. This surprised the earl and the head servant, but both had their own ideas about it. Swain wanted one. The servant hoped that in the future this would lead to a romantic story that would give the empire a new heir. The count thought that the lord would still stick to neutrality in this situation. The emperor was informed that the princess wanted to have a tea party and the lord thought that it was worth preparing a gift for the lady. Swain was surprised because Ebenezer had never been so concerned before. His Majesty said that it would be a kind of thanksgiving that my lady had been able to entertain him and ordered something befitting her status to be prepared. After several minutes of silence, the elder obeyed. Hilaria, meanwhile, was studying her book carefully again in her rooms. The maid stood nearby, always ready to help, and my lady turned to her, asking if Olivia was somehow related to the Empress. The princess already knew that she had strong protection, but her reputation in the palace wanted better. Trelaster replied that the lady was somewhat noted for her greedy nature, was very spendthrift. The maid also reported that when the princess had a meeting with the emperor. This made Olivia very angry, and she even beat the maid. Hilaria exhaled, realizing that the concubine had a complex character. The princess knew that Count Erasmus had moved to the capital precisely because of his daughter. The man was ready for anything, because he understood that the life of the whole family depended on the only child. Milady asked about Jane. The maid replied that she was the only one who maintained neutrality. Although she communicated with Lady Charlotte, she was also closely related to the Empress, who was at enmity with the concubine. In addition, Jane was quite modest and kept away from family life. The princess also knew about this, because her butterflies could not find the girl outside her rooms which was a little surprising. However, the future that the princess saw did not at all correspond to the description of the young lady who wandered about her now. Hilaria abruptly closed the book and decided to meet her personally, thanking the maid. The next day, the concubines came to meet the princess. However, each of them looked at her with hostility, except for Jane, who seemed to remain indifferent. Milady thanked them for coming, 
The concubines sat down at the table, and the princess took the floor. She thanked Lady Charlotte for being able to gather everyone, but looking at her she noticed that the girl looked depressed, even in front of everyone. This greatly surprised Milady, because she thought that the lady would behave as usual so as not to let her authority in front of the other concubines. It seemed that yesterday's conversation had confused the poor woman. The princess decided to leave it for later and turned her head to Lady Jaina. She immediately reciprocated, but she remained quiet and calm as they said. Milady turned her attention to her hands. She noticed that her joints were very protruding and there were calluses, so she concluded that the girl liked to spend time fencing. Usually noble ladies have delicate and beautiful hands. The princess decided that she would definitely talk to her separately later. Meanwhile, Jane did not understand what was happening. It all started with the fact that I received a strange letter from Charlotte, and the atmosphere is also strange. Olivia looked nervous, but she didn't hide it. She also received a letter, and what's more, she didn't like that the new girl was sticking her nose everywhere. The other concubines were also not like themselves. Since yesterday, everything has gone against her. First, my father came home very late, and then that letter. She screamed and threw things while her father tried to calm her down. The man assured that the new concubine was nothing unusual from some distant village, so it was not worth paying much attention to it. However, the lady was not angry at this, but at the fact that she climbed everywhere. The count went on and said that the lady had the appearance of a true witch, but all events spoke to the contrary. The girl thought about her father's words, because the emperor was very interested in the concubine. Her father assured her that the princess knew how to bewitch people, but Olivia thought it was funny. However, she knew that even Charlotte had succumbed to her, which meant that something was wrong. She thought, Erasmus did not have the best opinion about one of the concubines. He continued to reassure his daughter and conveyed the words to the empress that the emperor would come to her soon. The girl angrily turned around and screamed. She had been promised this for a long time, but the owner still did not come to her. The count did not want his daughter to get angry because it harmed her health. She still had the opportunity to make the emperor happy with a son. But Olivia was even more angry because his majesty still did not come to her, and she did nothing to help, neither bewitching aromas nor useful herbs for pregnancy. Everything is in vain. However, the father knew how to cheer up his only child and gave her a high-quality opal that he brought from Oswald. The girl took the gift in her hands and immediately calmed down looking at the stone. When the daughter finally calmed down, the count decided to inform her that the empress also did not like the new concubine. Olivia was genuinely surprised and asked if the woman had also given her something. The empress always conveyed something from herself when Erasmus visited her, like when she handed the poisoned cake to Charlotte's maid. The girl laughed at the concubine who did not know the truth. The count replied that the empress did not convey anything special. She only said that she hoped to soon expel the princess from the castle, because she was also like a bone in her throat, but she wanted the lady to help. The girl was glad that the empress trusted her, so she thought about how she could expel the princess. She realized that, like Venice, Hilaria also needed to find what she was afraid of. In a moment, she asked her father for any information regarding Guinevere's principality and the girl's place in it. About her childhood, which she could hide, even minor rumors were important. The count supported his daughter's passion and promised to fulfill the request. She smiled and told herself that she would not betray the trust of the empress and her father, so she promised to win this case at any cost. Sitting at the table now, she remembered yesterday. She focused her gaze on Hilaria and mentally began to rejoice that the princess did not have long to stay in the palace, and it would soon be over. Olivia decided to make her move and turn to the princess, saying that the rumors were not lying about her upbringing, and now she understood it, because first of all, the lady herself had to visit each of them. The rest of the concubines were stunned by the statements of their friend, but silently watched the development of the situation. Meanwhile, the girl went further and bluntly said that the difference in their upbringing was great and it didn't matter at all from which village this princess came. When Olivia fell silent for a moment, there was an oppressive silence around the table. Hilaria looked at her rude interlocutor and smiled sinisterly. Meanwhile, there was also unrest in the palace of the Guinevere Principality itself. In one of the rooms, the brothers and sister of the princess gathered and began to discuss her stay in the imperial castle. Relatives were very worried about their sister 
because they considered her weak, even though she was smart, so they were sure that she would not disappear, but they did not worry less. If they didn't want to visit her, but they couldn't. After Olivia's carelessly thrown words, there was silence at the table, no one said a word, and Katie, who was watching the tea, shared with Coloster that she was very worried. A childhood friend assured that no one could stop her lady. The maid thought about it, because she had heard that the Count's daughter was also not from simple people, so she also felt some concern about this. Hilaria finally forced herself to smile and say that the Imperial Palace was indeed a strange place, with many interesting people. Olivia did not understand what the princess was leading to, so she asked again. Milady turned to Lady Charlotte, remembering that she had promised her to learn more about life in this castle. The lady bowed her head a little, and her voice was very quiet. She confirmed these words, nothing more. The princess breathed a sigh of relief, glad to hear such an answer. She continued in a sly tone and said that the emperor would be happy if the concubines could live in peace, so she asked the lady for advice. Hilaria looked into Olivia's eyes and asked Charlotte how to deal with a person who behaves like a madman who is completely detached from reality. After hearing these words, the lady became wide-eyed. The concubine suddenly jumped up and started shouting at the princess, ordering her to know her place. Milady did not answer this, and the girl began to look for support from the rest of the concubines. She turned to Charlotte, hoping she would say something, but she couldn't say anything. Only now did she understand why the princess asked everyone to gather and did not expect to fall into a trap. The lady didn't know what to do, because no matter whose side she took, she would end up losing in any case. If you think about it this way, with each new concubine who arrived, there were always quarrels for primacy. However, the order itself remained unchanged. When Hilaria arrived, she completely turned the whole castle upside down. Everyone now followed only her. Even Olivia couldn't outdo the princess. The girl understood that the only thing they could achieve was to remain in their position, so she scolded the Count's daughter and took the side of Milady, because she only wanted them all to be friends. She continued and said that she was the one who initiated the tea party. If it wasn't there, but Milady had a high status, so they had to show respect to her. Katie caught her breath. The concubine was bursting with anger. She could not believe that Charlotte said all this but she was not going to apologize to the princess. Hilaria was pleasantly surprised by the defender's words. She definitely did not expect that she would start to protect her and not take the side of the concubine, whom she had known much longer than her. The lady decided that in such a case it was necessary to strangle her friend, so she thought about how exactly. The princess decided that it was time to ask about the death of the concubine of Venice, because she already knew that her death was not an accident. It was a carefully planned murder that benefited Olivia. There were rumors that the culprit was Charlotte, who brought the poisonous cake, and everyone believed it, but in fact the girl was framed. After the death of the concubine, her entire clan, Sebastian, soon went bankrupt. They were accused of corruption and each member of the family was tied up. The family of the Count's daughter received the greatest benefit from this. The concubine died, and her family disappeared and this issue was never raised again. Everything had to remain like that until the last surviving heir of the family, Sebastian, destroyed Guinevere. He planned to take revenge on the emperor and therefore spread gossip about the principality. Thus, her principality became a bait for Winfred and was on the verge of destruction. To prevent such a future, the princess brought the entire Sebastian family to her house before they were complained about. She continued to keep the entire family under surveillance to keep her home safe while she was gone. The girl did not feel hostile toward the deceased, but had to protect her land at any cost. The princess thought so much that she did not notice how Swain approached. She did not expect to see him here. The elder apologized and informed that the emperor intended to attend the tea party in person. All the girls were instantly startled. It seemed that not a trace remained of their enmity. The servant informed that the owner would come only to present a gift for the first tea party of my lady. Hilaria pretended to be happy about this news, but inside everything shrunk. She began to be tormented by the question of why now and why the emperor wanted to come. Hands began to tremble. The princess looked back at the rest of the concubines and noticed that their faces had changed. If his majesty personally wished to present a gift in public, then this could provoke my lady. The girl forced herself to calm down, although she did not know how Ebenzer wanted to test her, 
but it would not be right to refuse the owner. She smiled and wanted to show what he wanted. She thanked Svein for the warning. When he left, Milady turned to the rest of the concubines and informed them that they should show themselves in a beautiful light if the emperor came to them. The princess emphasized that they should all stop their quarrels for the time being, so as not to show this to the owner. She especially emphasized this to Olivia. The concubine blushed with anger but remained silent. Hilaria slowly got up from her chair, remembering that there was a beautiful imperial garden next to the gazebo. She suggested that everyone go for a walk to get some fresh air and cool off a little. Milady smiled warmly and held out her hand to Olivia, hoping that she would not give up on her idea. The Count's daughter was dumbfounded for a moment, looking at her opponent's hand, not understanding what she was trying to achieve. The girl was wary because she could not understand the reason why the princess suddenly wanted to walk with her, but in a moment she smiled maliciously because it was only in her hand. For some time, the ladies walked in silence. Hilaria walked in front like this and asked for the Count's daughter. Milady spoke first, looking at the garden. She said she was very surprised when she first saw it. The princess said that then he himself seemed too big and beautiful to her. He was beautifully decorated. The interlocutor did not really want to answer, but in the end decided to support the conversation. Olivia carefully looked at the princess who had been humiliating Charlotte until recently. However, it seemed to the lady that she could worry in vain, because her rival looked rather too naive. The concubine examined Milady from head to toe and noticed something that she had not paid attention to before, namely, individual things, and after evaluating them, she could not believe that some princess from the village could be so rich. In the end, the girl realized that Hilaria did not look like the witch her father described her as. Opposite was very pretty, and it made me very angry. Nevertheless, she did not understand what had so affected the owner in her. The thought that the emperor personally wants to give the princess a gift to support the idea of a tea party was disturbing. She suddenly felt very offended because she did not understand why she was worse. Olivia did not even notice how they reached the place that the princess wanted to show her, so she pushed her rival's voice out of her thoughts. An amazing landscape opened before them, which took the breath away. The girl almost boiled with anger. She had heard that there was a lake in the Rose Palace, but she had no idea that it was so big. It became envious that such beauty and greatness were saved to give to Hilaria. The lady, surprisingly even for herself, admitted that the place was really very beautiful. She was suffocating with envy, but she tried to squeeze out a miserly smile and almost admitted that she was angry. Wanting to finally put her plan into action, she slowly began to approach her rival and began to say that the bigger and smaller she is, the more modest and grateful she should be to the owner. One more step, and the lady wanted to push Hilaria into the water, but at the very last moment she turned sharply and met her eyes. Olivia was dumbfounded, not understanding what was happening. The Count's daughter stumbled and knew she was about to fall. Already preparing to fall into the cold lake, she closed her eyes, but the cold still did not set in. Opening her eyes, she saw that her hand was being held tightly. The princess grabbed the concubine's hand, preventing her from falling. Milady was smiling looking at her, and thoughts were swirling in her head that the opponent was too obvious and the lady knew about everything in advance. But the girl herself will never know that hundreds of butterflies followed her from the very beginning of the walk. This could be noticed at the tea party, so the princess specially brought her here. The concubine began to break free and scream at the princess to let her go. Hilaria smiled innocently and began to say that she was not letting her fall, but took pity and let her go at her request. Olivia screamed again, but she never reached the water. She looked around trying to see what was holding her. The princess began to get annoyed by the proximity of her rival and her butterflies too. The concubine began to almost threaten Milady because she did not understand what was keeping her from falling and although the princess confessed about the butterflies, the girl thought that they were some kind of invisible nets. The lady exhaled. The princess threatened her that the same thing that she did to Venice might happen to her. What I heard shocked the concubine, because she was sure that she had long ago gotten rid of everyone involved in this information. She began to demand an explanation as to how Milady knew about everything, but the girl did not answer. She only said that the concubine should behave quietly, and then no one would find out about what she had done, especially the emperor. 
The princess tried to make her swear that she would continue to behave like a mouse, but Olivia did not give up. She was ready to kill her rival even now, because she learned about her innermost secrets. Hilaria let out a sigh of regret, because she still hoped for the last glimpses of the concubine's mind, but in vain. In the end, she realized that it was useless to continue the conversation, so she let her opponent go. A few minutes later, the concubine emerged from under the water, menacingly cursing the culprit and promising revenge. Katie and Chaloster saw that the girl could do something and wanted to stop it. The princess stood nearby and watched silently. Her friend tried to cover her from the angry concubine. The maids tried to calm the angry woman and informed her that the emperor was coming soon. But she was indifferent to all persuasions and warnings. She accused Milady of pushing her into the water. Hilaria made an innocent look and quietly replied that she caught her on the contrary. Olivia was almost bursting with anger. She wanted to scream again, but she did not notice how the owner approached. He instantly put an end to the girl's mindless bickering, especially in this garden. When the concubine saw the emperor, she asked him to punish the princess and claimed that she threw her into the water, but Ebenezer disagreed and said that everyone saw the truth. The girl tried to explain, but his majesty was tired enough and did not want to listen to any more lies or excuses, so he ordered her to shut up in a threatening tone. She looked shocked. The lord called Olivia's maid and ordered to escort the concubine back to the palace. The maids immediately ran to carry out the order, trying to take their mistress away, but she did not want to give up. In the end, the enraged concubine was dragged away and forced to return to the palace. Charlotte and Jane went with her. The latter looked around for a moment, looking indifferently at the princess. When there was no one left around, Milady quietly approached and thanked the emperor for helping to resolve the situation. She gave him a guilty look and pulled him away slightly. The lord smiled at this. It seemed to his majesty that the princess was very frightened, so he recommended that she also return to the palace as soon as possible and rest. She thanked him, but thought she heard hints of abuse. However, the owner did not forget why he came here in the first place, so he called the servant and took the casket, in the hope that a small gift would be able to cheer up the princess. He handed her the casket. Milady accepted the gift with sincere gratitude and hastened to open it. Looking inside, she saw a very beautiful and delicate necklace. Receiving sunlight, the stone glowed brightly. The emperor admitted that he had specially ordered this decoration for her. The golden topaz was like her eyes. However, what she heard surprised her, because she did not understand what the owner was leading to. She had blue eyes. They only turned golden when she used magic, but if she used little power, the hue would only change for a moment. Recently, the lady has often used butterflies. However, she never did this in front of the emperor. The princess was wary and did not understand how the lord could have learned about her power. Milady sincerely hoped that it was all a coincidence. The lady tried to discern how much his majesty really knew. She smiled and said that she did not really understand what he was leading to, because her eyes were a completely different color. The lord also smiled. Abenzer was quick to explain that he meant the very shape of the pendant, which was similar to the shape of her eyes. The princess breathed a sigh of relief and tried to believe that it was true. The emperor asked for permission to wear this ornament on her personally, and she agreed, but in her mind she did not understand why he was in no hurry to leave. The owner approached and slowly put on the necklace. While he was fiddling with the fastener, he accidentally touched her skin and she felt that his hands were very cold, and because of her increased temperature it was felt even more, to the point of tingling. Due to the fact that the owner was in no hurry to put on the jewelry, her ears began to turn red. The emperor noticed this, and, leaning slightly towards her, whispered in her ear that she was very cute. The lady jumped back. Ebenezer sincerely wished her to wear this gift for a long time. He was glad that his sense of style did not let him down. This decoration suited the girl very well. She thanked me once again and promised to wear it more often. His Majesty finally said goodbye and hurried to leave the garden, because he still had a lot to do. All this time Duke Clarinet watched over them from the side. The young gentleman carefully looked at the girl. The Duke saw the princess for the first time, and looking at her, did not notice what they were talking about. He paid special attention to her eyes, which, he had to admit, attracted attention. The Emperor suddenly called him. Clarinet realized his mistake and immediately started apologizing, explaining that he didn't mean anything bad. The Emperor smiled with satisfaction 
when he saw that the duke had admitted his guilt. However, in a moment, the lord's gaze became icy, and he warned the lord not to loose his tongue about the princess, otherwise even he would not be able to save him. The duke bowed his head more, promising to remain silent. However, he could not escape the fact that the emperor really treated the princess differently than he did with other concubines. It seemed to the gentleman that there was something between the two, but he did not know what. Returning to her room, she almost collapsed from exhaustion. After sitting on the chair, I didn't want to get up any more. Katie supported her lady because she knew that she had a very difficult time today. Her friend also brought crystals, but the princess didn't want to do anything today, and she could regain her strength only after a good night's sleep. The maid asked if the lady needed anything else, but she sent her away. When the girl left the room, she informed Coloster that the princess had sent them both to rest today. The maid did not argue, but noticed that the relationship between the emperor and the lady had become better. Katie did not attach much importance to this because she had known the princess for a long time and was sure that everything was completely wrong. However, the friend was sure that if it was true, it would be better for everyone. In a moment, the girl turned sharply, remembering that Hilaria could have eavesdropped on their conversation with the help of butterflies, but she could not admit it. She only told the maid not to say too much. However, the conversation of the girls was followed not by the princess, but by the emperor himself. On his hand sat a butterfly, which Milady had created to follow the emperor. He felt somewhat sorry for the words of the maid. The lord found out that the princess controlled the spirits of fire. He felt it, because this little butterfly was blowing a strong flame. The butterfly suddenly began to fuss, trying to escape. The emperor tried to catch the spirit, but it could not escape far. Ebenzer knew this, because the butterfly was flying inside the cage, which was visible only to him. The insect tried to fly away, but could not. His majesty continued to speak to the creature and asked him to be patient a little longer until he and the princess became closer. After that, he promised that he would give a name to this spirit. The owner thought about it and decided not to delay the promise, so he named the butterfly Hill. That was how Bia's close friend called the princess, and his majesty knew about it. He smiled with satisfaction. The princess sat on the veranda in her palace and thought. She had already taken off the jewel the owner had given her and put it back in the casket. Milady could not understand why, exactly. It was a pity that she could not make her butterflies fly near him. Suddenly, the lady remembered the moment when the emperor had put that necklace on her and whispered sweetly. It made me a little angry. For her, it was a kind of insult because she did not consider herself cute. She was sure that Ebenezer wanted to make fun of her in this way. The princess decided to strike back at this rudeness. She thought about where she could hit, and it occurred to her why he became emperor in the first place. Even despite the love of the subjects, most of the aristocrats supported Prince Nason. The emperor lost his own mother when he was still a child, so she thought that it was much more profitable to take the side of the son of the second empress. However, after the death of the previous owner, he was sent into exile. Just then, Ebenezer ascended the throne. The princess continued to search for a reason, but the only thing that came to mind was the possibility of some kind of treaty with the previous emperor, or some secret being the cause. It still bothered her that her butterflies could not get close to him and died immediately. All these thoughts gave her a headache, everything was very confusing, and my lady breathed hard. She needed someone to share these thoughts and feelings with. She quickly enchanted one butterfly and sent it to Beatrice to convey the request for a meeting for tomorrow. Meanwhile, in the Begonia Palace, Olivia did not stop getting angry, but no one, except the poor servant, heard her. The maids suffered severe physical injuries while their mistress smashed everything around them. One of the maids finally dared to speak to save the rest from beatings. The girl reported that everything looked as if the concubine herself had fallen into the water. The lady turned sharply at the servant's voice. The poor woman was very frightened, so she immediately said that all the maids believed the words of their mistress and suggested that the princess might have been up to something. Milady agreed with this, because she herself thought so.